Hey, uh, having you here for the blog and uh, Todd, if you could tell me a little, you know, about your background and everything. Sure. Uh, for the blog, Control Your Climate, it would be awesome. Okay. Well, I'm happy to talk to you. Um, so my PhD is in aquatic ecology. So I've worked on projects everywhere from across the U.S. I moved to Florida from Utah. Um, so I know a lot about drought. I've done a lot of stuff on the Colorado River. I've had projects in China, New Zealand, Australia, South America, and it's all about water. And so one of the things you asked me earlier is, it will water be an OPEC-like resource? I think the answer to that is yes. I think it, it will be in our lifetime that water is a, is a resource that people fight wars over. And I think you'll see that in Africa. We have a uh, a big project in Africa, sort of looking at the politicization of water and stuff like that. But before that, let me. Uh, so I have a PhD in aquatic ecology. I am now the director of the Southeast Environmental Research Center here at Florida International University. We have just created the International Institute for Water and the Environment to sort of bring together all water science across Florida International as well as some other partner universities. So water is what we do, um, and that's what we think a lot about. Um, <clears throat> So the issues associated with water in South Florida, you, you know about a lot of them. Uh, the, the biggest thing that I think people don't understand is we talk about sea level rise, we talk about Everglades restoration. People think about those as two different things. But in fact, they're really very similar and, and completely linked together with what we call hydrology, groundwater hydrology. So if you can imagine, the Everglades used to be this, this uh, 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 huge wetland full of fresh water. Of course it goes up during the wet season and down during the dry season. Well what's happened north of us up by Okeechobee that's become more agricultural land. We hold more water for people, more water for other kinds of uses. So we get less water during the rainy season and very little during the dry season. What's happened then over the years is the water table has gone down, down, down. You couple that with draining it with all of these canals that we've built to drain the canal so we could have more irrigation, more agriculture. We have a, a, an Everglades that's probably only half as full as it used to be. Now if you start talking about sea level rise coming up, what happens is as the water comes up, it pushes, right? And so you have this imbalance. Sea level's higher than fresh water, so it starts going down and under the ground. When you talk about sea level rise, storm surge, lots of people think about what comes over the shore. and They talk about the buildings and stuff. What I'm much more worried about, and I think we should all be worried about from a freshwater uh, resource perspective, is this infiltration of our fresh water with salt water through the ground. And that's the biggest thing we think about when we think about what kinds of science should we do, what kinds of questions should we ask about Everglades restoration. So that's sort of the context of the kinds of things we do. Having said that, we're still very interested in the resiliency of the buildings we've built. Um, I, I just said a lot of our issues are because we moved water from the Everglades into agriculture. Still, we have to have food. We have to have agriculture. So one of the other things we really worry about is you know, how do we maintain some food production with fresh water, with an infrastructure for people, and keep that all in a balance? And that's the hard thing to think about. That's the, those are the kinds of questions we ask and, and the kinds of research we do at the Southeast Environmental Research um, Center. Um, our, our newest projects are sort of looking at, well, we bring in architects, we bring in engineers, we bring in lawyers, besides just ecologists and hydrologists. And we actually ask questions like, okay, if the sea level is going to rise 10 feet, what do we do at South Miami? What do we do at Miami Beach? What do we do in these places to sort of maintain a livelihood in these cities that are going to sort of have water coming up? And so we work very closely with Miami Beach, for example, to think about ways of adapting to sea level rise. At an ecosystem level, as I've already said, we think a lot about what are we going to do about getting more fresh water in the Everglades so that we win that pressure uh, race, right? The more water we have in the Everglades, the more it will push against sea level rise. And so the more resilient we'll be as, uh, for things, for the salt water and not getting in our groundwater. And then at the same time, how do we maintain enough fresh water to still maintain agriculture in Homestead and up north by Okeechobee and places like that? Because that's important economically, it's important for food. And so those are the really hard challenges. Um, we have a project right now that's developing where we're using South Florida, Miami as sort of one model system, comparing that to San Juan, Puerto Rico, comparing that to Haiti, and comparing that to Cuba 
asking questions about what can we do for countries that haven't developed yet to do a better job? What can they learn from us? And so, you know, we're using us, South Florida and Miami, as a test case. We've done some things really well. We've done some things really bad, right? And so what can we learn? How can we figure that out? And, and how can we help other Caribbean nations, island countries, sort of do a better job of maintaining good infrastructure, good drinking water, but, but being more resilient to the issues that they're going to have and not running into the issues we have. So those are the kinds of things we do. Awesome. Uh, and sitting down with Professor Stoddard, I know you're familiar with yep. the mayor of uh, South Miami. He talked about the futures and the worst case scenario of how in a hundred years from now, you know, when the keys are gone and a lot of South Miami's gone, you're, we're going to be faced with a transit economy, as he called it, mm -hmm. where, you know, instead of maybe a mass migration of people like with Katrina, they slowly move out. And you talked about how architectures, lawyers, you guys have already started to see the big picture uh, of the future for uh, Florida. And eventually, uh, worst case scenario, the sea level rises where Miami's underwater. Uh, do you see... Um, do you see FIU possibly having to transition uh, to maybe uh, higher and higher north into Tallahassee? Do you see uh, maybe still people living here and maybe they become a boater uh, society? Mm -hmm. Do you see uh, how how do you see that economic effect uh, where we tr like like Professor Stoddard said we transition uh, instead of abruptly more gradually as long as we take our bumps accordingly we know what's coming. Yeah, no, no, that's a great question. I mean, I, I think there will be a time, just like in geologic history, there have been lots of times when South Florida didn't exist. It was all underwater. And, and there will be a time when that happens again. But in the meantime, what I think is that we need to sort of think hard about what the issues are, think hard about what our opportunities are, and, and sort of start thinking about how to build resilience into what we want to keep. What that's going to mean is making some hard choices. We're not going to have the population spread all across South Florida in the Keys like we do now. I think what we're going to have to do is decide this place we're going to keep, which means we have to build it up. And that means this place we have to give up. And we're going to dig it out, dig the soil out of there, dig the rocks and stuff out of there, and build something else up. That'll change our economy completely. I mean, I don't think 100 years from now we'll be having a thriving agricultural economy. I think what we might do instead is have a thriving island type economy. We could be the port city of the world where we build a basically, you know, a, a, a port and a city that's above sea level, that's basically built on stilts or whatever, where food comes in, we've got trains going out and we basically supply food to North America, the eastern part of North America. So there are, there are economic options that we have. The hard thing is to figure out which of those ways to go. Everything has a trade-off. Everything has a cost and, a, a, and, a, and a, a benefit. One of the things I'm trying to do here at FIU with through CERC and then with our architect uh, colleagues, computer science colleagues, engineers, is we're going to hold an international conference to talk about what are the best, smartest buildings we can build that are resistant and resilient to sea level rise and stuff like that and come up with a model of what a building would look like and then build it on campus. Have it be one of the FIU campuses. Well, we're going to have to change. It turns out if you look at the future 20, 30 years from now, FIU is going to go underwater way before Miami Beach does. We're lower than most of those places and that, that water will come from the ground up. And if you go over to Sweetwater, you were talking about that, they already can see the water coming up and down almost on a daily basis. It's almost getting to the point where they start flooding and now they've got pumps pumping and, and all of that stuff. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's a lot of really hard choices. It, it always comes down to, so who is going to go, where are you going to take the dirt, and who's going to stay, and where are you going to build up? And so I think there'll be a, a significant amount of migration north. You know, the Orlando area is much higher than we are here. Um, uh, there, there are places in in South Miami like Coral Gables that are pretty high relative to other places. So they'll still probably be around. Um, they'll be dry in 80 or 100 years. The question is, what's the infrastructure look like? You have to get fresh water in. You have to get waste out. You have to get food in. So you can't just be an island by yourself, right? Some of those houses will be standing there, but what are they connected to? And those are the kinds of questions 
that are really hard. That's not an ecologist kind of a question, but an ecologist can talk about, you know, where's the fresh water going to come from and, and stuff like that. But, but I, I think it's not going to be anything abrupt. I think everybody's starting to think about it now. Florida is a fascinating place to me. I mean, I, I just moved here from Utah, which is a very conservative state. Florida is also pretty conservative. I mean, we have a governor who said you're not allowed to talk about climate change. And yet that's all anybody talks about down here. I mean, because that affects you every day. It affects your livelihood and stuff like that. So the, the good news is I think the people of South Miami take it very seriously that we are ground zero. We're going to be one of the first places that gets most affected by sea level. So we're thinking about that really, we're asking really hard questions. Now you, you kind of alluded to the next question where uh, you've been blessed to move around this great nation, uh, live in different uh, parts of uh, or regions is in the U.S. and obviously be a part of different projects from rivers to oceans and everything else. Do you see a growth uh, within your field where kids are coming in more aware, more passionate about, uh, you know, climate change or uh, how, how our ecosystem will have an economic uh, effect on us, any of the political science majors, due to the fact that, you know, when you think about when I was a little kid uh, 20 years ago, right. recycling was this big initiative where people were just to separate glass, paper, right. and yeah. whatnot. Uh, people were like, well, why not we just throw it all in the landfill? Do you see an, a, a, a huge evolution from that? I, I wouldn't say it's a huge evolution. I mean, it, you hit it right on the head. The way kids learn, the way kids think, and the way young adults react is all based on experiential learning. There's still a big part of North America where sea level rise is not an issue, right? Iowa kids aren't going to talk about it. They might talk about drought and what that does in terms of corn yields and stuff like that. And so climate... Uh, uh, Big changes associated with things like climate, I think yes, there's a more a bigger awareness. But it all is really based on sort of where you live and what the issues are that face you. And so, you know, it's not surprising in South Miami that kids are pretty savvy. You get a lot of high schools, all their projects are about sea level and climate change and stuff like that. Um, my father will argue that I became an aquatic ecologist because I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. And when I was a kid, the Cuyahoga River caught on fire. It was so polluted that it actually started on fire, and I saw that. And so he said, you know, I was fascinated with water and water pollution ever since then. So, you know, it's all about what you experience. So I, I'm excited. I think, I think kids are more aware. They don't ask questions about is it really happening and stuff like that that adults still do. They just they say, okay, it's happening, so what do we do? And, you know, and they, they ask sort of fundamental questions about what do you do next. And I, and I think that's, that's a really good thing. And, Again, you know, kids in California are going to know a whole lot about droughts and fires, you know, and, and, and do already. The, the folks around here think a whole lot about sea level rise and saltwater intrusion and stuff like that. So, yeah. and, and then lastly, uh, thank you for the wealth of knowledge you've been giving to us. What, what do you hope for the future generations? I know I talked to uh, Professor Stoddard and he had the thought that maybe we invent something that gets reused a hundred times and they, people take pride in the fact that we have a material that we can recycle more than the other guy or our future kids when we think, hey, we wrapped everything in plastic, wow, Grandpa, that's crazy. Do you have a vision for uh, the, the future and where uh, people's awareness or hopefully where generations will be? Yeah, I, I think all those things. I mean, I, I already see, you know, I judge a lot of high school science fairs and stuff like that. I mean, I am absolutely fascinated by how many young people are thinking about solar power, thinking about electric cars, thinking about, you know, people are trying to think about how to best use things. The technology's not there yet. You know, we still don't, aren't very good at batteries and storage, but people really are thinking about that a lot. People are going back to the movement of more natural foods. They're willing to pay a little bit more for foods that didn't have pesticides and herbicides and all of that stuff, and, and they don't grow as big and as dense. Um, I'm even hearing people talk about the fact that our agriculture has gotten so weird with all the chemicals and stuff that nothing tastes good anymore. And so they'd rather it taste better the way it used to taste and stuff like that, which is funny for a 14-year-old to talk about how it used to taste. Right? <laughs> but I, I think I think all of those things are a step in the right direction. And I, you know, as soon as businesses get on on board with some of the 
it's going to take something like some brilliant high school or college kid coming up with a new way of storing solar power or wind power uh, to, to make a car or an airplane or a boat go. And some business is going to say, oh, there's an economic gain here. And as soon as, the, as soon as small businesses and the business community in general get behind this, then I think we're going to go in the right direction. When I think about sea level rise, I think about places like Miami, San Francisco, Boston, there are some enlightened cities, New York now, sadly because of Katrina uh, um, and some of these big storms. But they're now starting to say, wow, what's it cost us not to think about this? What does it kind of cost us if we have to replace all these cities? We better start thinking about it now. We better start building in resilience. And those are all the steps in the right direction. Well, thank you for your time today. And, you bet. Um, it was a pleasure speaking to you. Yeah, thank you.